All right. Um, so we're recording. Uh, so Carmen, tell us a little bit about yourself and your writing and uh, what you're working on. All right. So um, when I was in college, I was an English education major. So I had to take writing classes. And uh, through those classes, I started writing more and learning how to write fiction and nonfiction. So um, since then, I've written a little bit of nonfiction, magazine article here, community newsletters there, um, trying to write things for like nonprofits, like a small Christian school that just started and different things. So a lot of it, it has been nonfiction. Um, but in the last year, I decided to launch into fiction and write a young adult novel. Awesome. And because I've been a teacher and an English teacher and work with young people. And so just trying to write something that will encourage them and strengthen them and give them, you know, a vision of what they can be and what they can do. And so, um, yeah, so I've been working with Ryan Coach for the last year, just really learning structure, how to structure a novel. And because it was such a big project and I needed accountability. And so now I'm writing the first few chapters. And I, when the opportunity presented itself to have to have the first chapter and things edited, I thought, well, I want this to be excellent. I want to do it well. And so I signed up. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Um, how do you like writing with a, working with a writing coach? I wish someone had told me years ago to get a writing coach. I mean, awesome. I really, I put my writing off for a long time because teaching was really my passion. I taught junior high and I loved teaching. And in the last couple of years, the door just closed where I was and then there was COVID. And so that just got pulled out of my life, which was very, very hard for me, but the Lord just started opening the door with writing. And cool. um, so then I just, the writing coach, it was something that I got to a writing conference and I got newsletters from her and anyway, just a whole journey, but a writing coach, I highly, highly recommend getting awesome. a writing coach because it just gives that great accountability and structure and encouragement to keep going because otherwise I would, I would not, and I knew that on my own, I would never be able to sit down and just write a book and yeah, just yeah. keep going with it. That's I, just, very cool. I just wouldn't. So yeah, That's highly awesome. recommend. Do you mind <laughs> since, I mean, you don't have to, but I love yeah. giving coaches publicity. Do you mind sharing her name? Yeah. RJ Tessman. RJ awesome. Tessman. All right. Website, so. RJ Tessman. Awesome. Very cool. Um, okay. So nice job, RJ, if you listen to this. Um, so if you, uh, so tell us a little bit about the piece that we're looking at today. Give us like some context for it. Yeah, so it's a young adult adventure novel. Um, it is fantasy in the sense that it's not a real place. So it's not exactly historical, but it won't really have a lot of magic, things like that. But it's kind of a made up place trying to go for kind of a Celtic early Britain feel with it. Nice. Um, and so the in a nutshell, the novel is about a forgotten princess who infiltrates the palace to retrieve an ancient manuscript that an illegitimate king desperately seeks to destroy. So in the opening here, she is um, on her way to a town with um, a group of musicians and a pastor, and they are about to um, attempt to smuggle a manuscript under the guise of a concert that they are about to do. And Eva has to play the main piece when that, con when that manuscript will be smuggled. And as your chapter one, this is the first time we're seeing these characters, right? Okay. Yes. Um, okay. That's important for what we want to talk about. So I have uh, like five things that I want to go through with you. Um, it's, and let me say before we get into like talking about uh, places to strengthen the piece, it's it, the conflict strong. It moves really well, right? Like you've got, um, a really great conflict for Eva. She's making choices through the whole piece. Um, we don't get to see the consequences to her practicing, but uh, it's there. So the piece is really solid. Like it is a good first chapter. Um, I want you to hear that because as we start to talk about ways that it can improve, I want you to know that this is a solid start. Um, this is a really, I would read this first chapter. So just be encouraged that this is a good, you're off to a really good start. Um, I love what you're doing. So Eva is practicing the flute in this wagon. Um, and I love what you're doing here. You have her thinking the words internally as she practices the flute. I don't think I've seen that technique before. And it's, it was really great because it really like gave me the, um, I'm going to use the word spatial to talk about like the cinematic nature of the story. Um, 
so I apologize if you can hear my son in the background. It's, you know, it's Saturday morning. He's playing a video game behind me. It is like singing to himself. Um, it's, uh, this is, this is life. Uh, so it's got that really like cinema. It gives me the ability to cinematically pace out the story. So, because what you could have done is just given me one line about like Eva practiced again, but I wouldn't get the same emotive, um, uh, emotive uh, connection to what's happening when the way that you you spaced out this the flute. So really nice, nice job on that. Good, thanks. Yeah, um, and you wrote your own lyrics. That was great. Uh, yeah, just a warning to anybody listening: don't use other people's song lyrics. It's like somebody taking a chapter from your work and like sticking it in their book. It's not cool. Um, so unless it's uh, unless it's um, oh, what do they call it? Um, public domain yeah unless it's public domain which i'd imagine you could put some hymns in here that are public domain since this is is uh christian ya yeah. um yeah i've i've played with it but since because of the setting i'm putting in sometimes it's hard because it's not technically historical but i hate to put things in that are before the time period that i'm actually yeah. thinking about. so yeah, that's yeah. been kind of an interesting thought of if i'm going to do that or not yeah i like i like the fidelity to your time period that's nice um Anyway, the, the, like I was saying, though, this play, these places where she starts to practice and you bring in the hymn, um, you bring in the, the lyrics in her mind, like in this uh, italicized inner thought place is really great. Also props. I get so much crap because a long time ago I told somebody never to use italics. Um, you're using them really well. They're, uh, they're, they're always used for the same reason. They're, yeah, so it's really good. Uh, and the characters are fun. Right. Like I like I liked Eva. I liked her like inner anxiety around practice. I liked all of that. So you got some really great things working here in the piece that you're doing really well with. Um, what specifically I left you a lot of notes because it's that's what I do. Uh, what, what specifically do you want to focus on as we talk through the piece? Um, I think one thing I'm kind of struggling with and I it was kind of interesting after reading your feedback because um, some of my other chapters where I think a little bit more like this, and I've recently been going back and trying to fill in with, um, you know, description and the inner thoughts and things like that. And so finding that balance of, you know, wanting to get to dialogue and action and things, but you do have to set a scene. And so I think um, that and the other challenge I have with this scene is wanting instead of, you know, using dialogue, instead of using tags too much, you know, trying to connect action to the to what they're saying but because Eva is on the buckboard at the front of the wagon and most of the people are behind her and my point of view is third person limited I'm having a little bit of trouble with you know if she, her back is turned she has to turn around to see them to see any action that they do gotcha. versus um you know if she's facing forward how do I convey okay. something a little bit more strong with action but you know she without her actually you know, being able to see them. That is a great problem to solve. That's fantastic. Um, so let's talk about the scene changes first. Excuse me one second. <laughs> Sorry. Let's talk about the scene changes first because um, you're right. Like one of the notes I left you is that I don't know where they are, right? Like I don't know who's, how they're related to each other. Right, like who is so because I don't know where they are and how they're related to each other. The first person you introduced was a child. Let you gave me any kind of uh, you said Pastor Thomas is right arm snapped across Eva's torso as they dropped it out of the grove. So, Pastor, I know that okay, there's a pastor in the car. I know Eva's playing thing. You said the wagon's buckboard, and because my head immediately went to present time, I thought you meant a station wagon. So I'm imagining this pastor driving a car, right? And all these people in the back of the car. And then she's like, the you're like the wagon bed. I'm like, well, why does she call it the station wagon have a bed? Like, I don't know. Um, and then here you said little Helen's high voice nipped through the air. So now I know that there's a kid in the car. And Peter's asleep. But because you said little Helen, and this is the first character you gave me actual like physical reference for, I'm now imagining all of these people are, besides the pastor, are children in a station wagon. Okay. So okay. 
you didn't write anything to tell me that. Yeah. Right. Like, it's not like you were giving me clues to take my mind there. The problem is the absence of details allows the reader to fill in what their imagined fills in. And the problem is when I got down here and I found out there's a horse involved. Yeah. Now I'm like, oh, and I have as a reader, I have to come and reimagine everything I've read. I had this problem with my first book. I um, didn't describe the main character physically in any way. And it, when I got to chapter 24, it became important that he was African-American. And I gave the book to beta readers. And so many of them right off the bat wrote me notes about this isn't how I imagined him. And there's this sense of like betrayal that like, oh, you cheated me. Now that's an extreme example because I went 24 chapters without giving anybody any details. Um, that being said, we want to, uh, at scene changes specifically, we want to make sure we're bringing the reader into the important details. So we don't need to know everything. We just need to know a couple details to set the scene to let the reader know, hey, what's going on around them and who are who's in this conversation, right? Like who's going to be in this play which you do really well right like i've got all five characters right up front i know who's in the play i don't know how they're related to each other and i think as authors our desire is to jump to these like massive like we go one way or the other we're either super sparse and we're all dialogue and we have no description or we're super descriptive and we have like paragraph after paragraph after paragraph of like what the curtains look like in the ballroom right like we and finding that happy middle of like finding the strategic sentences that let our reader know here's what you should be seeing here's where you are so a sentence up front this starting sentence is great because it introduces your conflict i wouldn't change it it's a really strong starting sentence but a sentence somewhere up front maybe in here that says you know as Rhea the as the horse Rhea pulled the wagon along um up the dirt road through the countryside right like okay now i know exactly where i am and it was only those like seven words like that's all i mean does that make sense yes thank you yeah and so we want to do that at every scene change so when i say scene change um you may think of them as like beats in a story like whenever you you change whenever the physical setting is being changed because the way a lot of our stories work unless you're writing an action scene, which I can talk about in a second. But the way a lot of our stories work is we set a scene, we have characters in a box, right? In this box, they're in the wagon. In the next box, they're in the village. In the next box, they're like, the well, and then, sorry, they're in the wagon. And then the next box, they're getting out of the wagon. And in the next box, they're walking through the village, right? Like we've got these boxes that we put our characters in. And then within that box, the conversation happens. And the conversation is was actually like engaging our reader and driving the plot and moving everything forward. But when they're in the box, we need to let the reader know like, hey, this is our box, right? Like, and ideally let the reader know up front unless we want to surprise the reader with things intentionally. But the convention is let the reader know up front so the reader can imagine the scene, get a picture in their head of the scene and then move forward. Um, <clears throat> so you have a couple boxes. You got box one up front. And then your box two starts at the bottom of four um, when they come over the hill, right? Ray is straight to crest the hill. Um, yay, Helen's cheering through the sky as they bounced amongst the trees. Here's how you know you're changing boxes. When you jump time or have a summary paragraph, a few minutes later, Pastor Thomas ran Ray in and pulled them beside the clearing. So this is a box change. Right. Like and here you're giving me that one or two sentence description of what I should see that I really needed up here. Does that make sense? What you lose down here. Well, we'll we'll go there in a second. So you've got it here. The next box change is at six. <clears throat> um, where did it go? It's in here uh here you've got another scene change and this one you do really well with right like there you're giving us this like hey here's a description of what eva's seen 
which is great. It like shifts that focus. But there's another one where they're getting out of the out of the out of the. He, mm, I'm not finding it. There's another when they're getting when they start getting out of the wagon is the other box change um, that we need to see as well. Uh, yeah. So does that make sense? Like we whenever yeah. they're if you think of your conversation as these beats or these boxes whenever we move <laughs> from one beat to the next beat that's where you want to take a second and be like okay does my reader have all the spatial tools my reader mm -hmm. needs a brief a, a couple sentences about where they are so the reader can start to imagine the setting of themselves and then a couple sentences about who's going to be in this box with the, with my my lead character um, and then whenever you bring somebody else into a box, into the box, you want to introduce them. So if you've got a boxed scene going on and somebody is running alongside the wagon in the opening and jumps into the wagon, we want a one sentence explanation of the person that just entered the box. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how you're introducing characters. So that's introducing setting. Okay. To introduce a character, we want just a word or two of explanation of who that character is to your point of view right so pastor thomas's right arm pastor thomas is all i need because that title carries images with it does mm -hmm. that make sense like uh if you said dr thomas that would carry images with it if you said like nurse thomas right like um, you know, Officer Thomas, Magistrate Thomas, all of those like titles, that's all I need because now I have an image of who this person is, right? Little Helen's high voice. Now I have an image of who Helen is, but you left it out for Hannah groaned in the wagon bed. I have no, I don't know Hannah's age. I Like is Hannah the pastor's wife or is Hannah Eva's best friend or is Hannah like, so I just need some kind of descriptor for Hannah and then Peter Peter only grunted in his sleep. Again, like I don't know any, I have no context for Peter. Um, so all of these, those little notes there, um, allowing us to have context for what's going on. Does that make sense? Yes. Is there a love relationship building between Peter and Eva? No, no? okay. Um, I was curious because at the bottom, they have a playful banter and whenever there's a playful yeah. banter, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, the funny thing is, is that I plan my characters and I have my synopsis and everything, and but I didn't really know how I was starting this whole piece exactly, <laughs> and so I started, and I had Eva, and then I had the pastor, and her playing the flute, and then I thought, oh, well, she's going with a group of musicians, so I have to have musicians. It's really funny. <laughs> so it kind of appeared, so, but, um, but he's supposed to just be a musician that's kind of there, and they've all been in the same small town, they're on a mission together, so, um, there's going to be other bigger characters that come along um, gotcha. later So he's on. just the side but, character for the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, so I'd say something about like, if they're all musicians, I'd let us know here in this opening, what, what instrument they all play. Cause then we know like, Oh, this is a traveling band. Does that yeah. make sense? Something to like, give us just a little bit of insight. Again, I don't want like a paragraph that the other extreme and the reason I keep cautioning you this is because this is where we tend to go as writers. The other extreme is to be like Peter groaned in his sleep and then give me a whole paragraph. Peter and Eva had been friends for blah, blah, blah. They da, 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 <laughs> da, 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 da. And like, we don't need that. We really just need to know Peter, the stand up bass player groaned in his sleep. And now I've got an image of like, okay, like he's, he's at least old enough to play a stand up bass. Right, like, and he's is he's a musician like Eva. Like, that's why they're in this wagon together. They're not all Pastor Thomas's family, which is what I assumed when I started reading. Right, like, so that kind of um, interesting detail. It's something they say at um, some friends of mine have done Toastmasters, and they shared with me that like this is a thing they teach you at Toastmasters that if you're at a party and you're introducing people, you want to introduce them with like one interesting detail. Like, oh, this is my wife, Wendy, and she works at a church doing children's 
uh, stuff for kids. And this is, you know, my sister, Jenny, and she works at Michael's doing blah, blah, blah. Right. Like, but they want to like give an interesting detail of this person so that when you introduce somebody, there's common ground between two strangers to talk. That's kind of what's happening here is your reader is a stranger coming into a conversation with all of your characters. So give us like an interesting detail as like a launching place so that we can kind of put perspective in this. Now, the really great way to do this is that if any of these characters are long lasting through the book, is to think about where they're going and who they are and let that interesting detail guide us there. Right. Like, so if you can do it in a way that like leads us into the conversation, that's really great. Um, the other great way to do this is to give us an interesting detail that tells us how Eva, who's your point of view, feels or perceives these people. Right. So like if he's, if Eva believes Peter is always lazy, then like, you know, Peter, the fiddle player, uh, only grunted in his sleep. Like Peter, the fellow player, um, who was always seemed to be asleep, grunted, right? Like that kind of like always seems to be asleep lets us know that like, oh, Eva thinks Peter's lazy and is always asleep in the wagon. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So we've talked about seeing context and we've talked about introducing characters. Um, let's talk real quick as we're talking about seeing construction. Um, a big cast scene and how we keep characters a thing we need to pay attention to in a big cast scene so when i say big cast there's three kinds of scenes right there's one-on-ones which you know probably 50 percent of the scenes you're going to write are going to be one-on-ones they're going to be two characters engaged with each other then there's big cast scenes which is like three to five usually but a, a really skilled author can get like seven in there um i say that because we just i just read the house under the serenity by tj clune and he has big cast scenes with like eight people and i'm like oh that's not supposed to be a thing <laughs> um but he did it really well so a skilled author can get like more i can only get five uh so three to five and then um a chorus scene where you've got like seven or more. The thing about these scenes is that like the reader can only track so many voices at a time, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and at the same time, the problem we face as an author is we need to let the reader know how everybody's engaging in the scene, right? So one-on-ones are easy, right? Like one-on-ones, it's just a back and forth. They're always engaged. We can get rid of all SEDs, right? Like we can remove all SEDs. We can only use body language to convey things. Like it's great. Um, super, and it, it can be, we can get super artful. Chorus scenes can be that way too, because even though there's like seven or more people, they, you end up writing them like a big cast scene with like three people usually and grouping a, a, a lot of those people into like a chorus of people that all speak at once. Big cast scenes are the hardest. Because it's like a game of hot potato. Everybody has to play, right? Like everybody gets to play. Everybody in the scene gets to play. And we've got to, um, but at the same time, we don't want it to be predictable, right? You don't want to be like, Hannah said, Helen said, Peter said, Eva said, Hannah said, Helen said, e Peter said, Eva said. Like that's not necessary. That's too, like that's bringing them in too much. Um, so what we need to look for in these big cast scenes are moments of change or moments of reaction where everybody in the wagon is going to respond to something. And then we need to know how everyone responds, right? And this is, I'm using the wagon as like the example of the box we're talking about, but think of when you're thinking of your beats as boxes, think of this with every box. So for example, here, Right, you do it really well by letting us know everybody that's in the wagon. She plays a little bit. Eva yanks her fruit down. She's frustrated. Helen giggles. We get a shush. I think it's Eva because that's the interplay between the two of them. Um, Pastor Thomas talks. Eva plays. I think this is Pastor Thomas. 
right? Because Eva's not talking to him. Eva rolls her eyes. Eva goes back to playing. We have a constructed scene here where you've gone from Eva playing to Eva playing, right? You can kind of see the, the boxes of the moment. We've lost Hannah and Peter completely. Yeah, this was supposed to be Hannah shushing. Okay. Uh, but yeah. But again, I guess I, I had that issue of she's not turning around to see them. She just the shift. And so I guess like adding something of like she heard a sh or something. Yeah. And you you are completely avoiding the word said. Is that <laughs> yeah. on purpose? Um, I think I just had I I think I had I know I can use it I just much at this point but okay yeah I'm sorry pardon me for one second everybody on the podcast and Carmen I'm going to talk to my son Riggs yeah <laughs> no I can't spell right now go over there and play sorry um he and I are the only two people awake in the house and he's seven he doesn't understand that like zoom calls can't like this is a meeting where like I'm talking to somebody. He doesn't know. He's like, you're just on the computer. Like I'm on the PlayStation. What does it matter? Um, yeah. So I want you to avoid the word said less because yeah. this problem here is solved real quick with yeah. Shh, Hannah said, yeah. <laughs> right? Like yeah. she doesn't and how yeah. Eva doesn't need to see it. Yeah. Right. Like now Shh, Hannah said uh, it gets the job done. If you can somehow work some adjectives in there to let us know why Hannah is shushing or give Hannah a word or two to give Hannah intention, then Hannah's character becomes richer, right? Yeah. Helen giggled, shh, it's not funny, Helen said, or shh, don't laugh at people who are struggling, Hannah said, right? Now we start to learn a little bit more about Hannah's character, even though she's just a side character, right? Your readers are, are coming to the piece to enjoy, to feel like part of the party, right? Like that's why they're, they wanna be in the wagon. They wanna be with everybody hanging out. So give us a little bit of depth to Hannah. Yeah. What I also find is that when I start giving depth to characters, I end up bringing them back later because I start to like things about them and I'm like, oh, that's kind of fun. I kind of like that. And then later you'll have a scene where you're like, I need somebody that's like this. What about Hannah from the wagon? And then all of a sudden you'll pull Hannah back in and readers will love it because they'll be like, oh, Hannah from the wagon's back, right? Like, so that kind of like giving these characters more texture, um, more emotional texture, more like emotional intention in the wagon uh, will let us go. And in this big cast scene, if this were a two, a one-on-one, -on -one, Helen giggles shh, is fine. You'll notice I read it like a one-on-one -on -one, because you had Eva, Helen, unknown. So I'm Adam, I'm automatically going to assume that's Eva. Down here you've got uh, Pastor Eva, unknown. So I'm going to assume that's Pastor because our mind defaults to one-on-one. -on -one. So. If this isn't, and I would say, right, like you've got Helen, you've got Hannah, you've got Pastor, figure out how to give this line to Peter and put it in Peter's voice. Okay. Right. Um, now you have said Peter's asleep, so yeah. you don't necessarily need to bring him into this moment. Yeah. But that's just a way of saying like, okay, when I look at like from you know, change to change from her plane to her plane, those moments in the scene that are in the box that are moving. If I'm in a big cast combo, I want to try to get his, everybody's reaction to what's going on uh, so that the reader can feel like they're part of the party. Yeah, I've said this before, not today, but probably I did mention cinema stuff earlier. We're such a visual culture right we're an audible culture right like we're listening and watching all the time right like we're glued, we're glued to screens and sound all the time that we have the benefit to us as authors is our readers have overactive imaginations they've seen so much more than like you know jane austen's reader when she said a palace 
they may never have seen a palace because they're very limited as to like where they've been and the experiences they've had. But with the internets, we have all of the experiences. So there's a benefit to us as, as authors in that when you say a meadow or a glen, even if your reader lives in the middle of New York City, they've probably seen a meadow on TV or in a picture or something. So they can imagine that meadow right like so there's we have a shortcut to imagination we don't need the um you know three musketeers description of the curtains in the ballroom because yeah. they're writing for people dumas is writing for people who have never seen curtains in a ballroom so he has to describe them we could just say you know the extravagant curtains and our readers all get it right at the same time that means that we have to keep our readers' imaginations fed with the components of the scene. And part of the components of the scene are the characters that you have around. That's really interesting because I never thought of that before. And I've taught English as an English major, right? You know, you have Dickens's long descriptions and such, but I never thought of it in that way. So I'm going to use that someday. Nice. <laughs> if I ever teach again, I'm going to yeah. be like, hey, this is why this, but that makes, that makes complete sense. Yeah. yeah. And to be clear, I have not like, you know, seance Dickens up and asked <laughs> him why he's having these long descriptions. And that's just what makes right. sense to me. That like when I read an sense. older book, it does. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, oh, of course Dumas has to describe the armor of the three musketeers in this detailed way because he's writing to people who may have never seen that right like but we're not doing that we know it, even though i've never ridden in a horse-strong wagon i have but let's just say i haven't even though i have it i you know i might i know what that looks like because i've watched little house on the prairie as a kid right like so i know i can hear it and feel it and see it a little bit um which again is great because it allows us as, like, I don't want to see that as a disadvantage. I want us to see it as an advantage because it allows us to focus on the emotional texture of what's happening between the characters. That the truth is we can do far better than a television show, yeah. right? Like we can get inside a character's head in ways that television and movies will never be able to. So building that emotional texture, um, focusing on like the interaction the interplay between the characters and the feelings the characters are having and the experiences the characters are having gives us a direct line into our readers imaginations that we can have that other other um mediums don't get um yeah so we talked about big oh let's t pause here to answer your question about um well let me Sorry, before I move on, let me say, you'll see me all the time in your in your scene saying, who's this? Whenever you see that, when you go back to edit this scene, just know that what I'm doing there is saying like, hey, it's a big cast scene. You need to identify this person. And here, again, we have a song to song change. This is a fast one. So you're not yeah. gonna bring everybody in here, right? right? Like just having Eva or just having like, you know, Eva and the pastor is fine, right? Like you're not going to pull everybody into this one. But here, after the song change, um, we then get this like two page where they're going to get out of the wagon together, right? We need to make sure everybody's included. And the character you're losing here is Hannah. You've got Peter, Helen, the pastor, Eva, but I have no idea what Hannah's doing or how she feels about what's going on. So I would look to put Hannah in. Okay. Your kid voice with Helen is really good, by the way. I just wanted to note that for you. Kid voices are hard to write. It, a lot of times kids end up sounding like many adults, which can be cute, but Helen actually sounds like a kid, which is nicely done. Well, I have one child I work with who who I always have in mind with her, which is kind of interesting because sometimes they kind she can kind of talk like an adult, but mm -hmm. it's just interesting because like she can talk like an adult, but then she's like thinking of what she's trying to say she might try to say it three different ways just showing yeah. that um you know they can think very deeply they just can't always communicate what they're thinking right yeah then. and that's a great that character sense. note for helen right if you're going to bring helen around more um making sure that she has those those moments where she has like a deep thought but doesn't have the vocabulary to express it that's a really good 
that's a good character voice note when we're talking about like words body language cadence and pacing that goes into words it's like the language that she uses and the topics she discusses she wants to talk about deep things but she doesn't have the words for it so she's using like kid words to talk about you know things that we would probably simplify um that's a great voice note uh this is another place talking about um, your current aversion to the word said. This is another place where you have the ability to bring some emotional texture to this, right? Like, so the exchange is, um, you're doing just fine, Eva. We'll know the practice. We will all know you need practice. And so don't mind. Eva was sure Hannah was um, starting the fiddler, staring the fiddler down at the moment. Yeah, it's fine, Peter mumbled. Sure it is, Hannah thought. Um, you know, you didn't say Hannah thought, but I just wanted to include that for people listening. Uh, I think it's pretty. Thanks, Helen. So I know Helen's talking because you tell me Helen's talking here in the next line, but giving Helen some kind of body language here, because I think it's pretty could be said in multiple ways. It could be pacifying. It could be defending. It could be authentic, right? Like Helen could really like it. It could be trying to make her like compassionate, right? Like, so giving Helen some body language here to help us translate that I think is pretty brings more emotional texture to the moment. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think this was the spot that I had the issue where Eva had, had twist around and then she like turns forward kind of like trying to block out what's happening a little bit so she's not looking back at helen at this moment and that's yeah, i think where she, that issue came in of she can hear her... clapping cheering giving some texture to her voice right like with a laugh right like it is a problem you've worked yourself into <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and at the yeah. same time just yeah. think audibly right like think about how that voice sounds and what the texture of that sound is um yeah. to bring to allow our imaginations to run with it a little and it tells us something about the character, right? Like it tells us about Helen and who she is, um, which is what we really want to know. Does yeah. that make sense? Um, okay, we've talked about big cast scenes. We've talked about the problem of her not seeing everybody, that we've got to get creative with how we're running it. I will say the emotional texture, let me go back to that for a second. The emotional texture, because Eva is the character that carries through this, the emotional texture is really important with Eva. So I would, you know, I think it's pretty. If you don't want to get into Helen's emotional texture there and just leave it, thanks, Helen. How Eva says that helps us understand who Eva is, what her motivations are, and how she's going to change over the long haul of the story, right? Like, so, and I know that's a big thing to put on two words, thanks, Helen, but it's really on every utterance, right? Like we want to know how Eva's feeling. And there's a whole lot of ways that that thanks Helen can be interpreted. She can be truly appreciative. She could be dismissive. My bet knowing Eva so far is that she's dismissive, like whatever, Helen. Yeah. So like that kind of like giving us that emotional texture lets us know more about Eva. And this is just a place where that, uh, you know, three more words changes how we hear that how we imagine that phrase and so unless you're trying to have this rapid fire dialogue where you want to keep the pace up and people are just like firing things back and forth that's not this scene but if that's what you're looking for you're right you got to cut all those those rapid fires places have been best in one-on-ones right mm -hmm. because we can just let the characters go back and forth in that like you know west wing gilmore girls type of rapid fire conversation here this isn't that rapid fire conversation so let's go ahead and include some texture to it does that make sense okay we've talked about sorry i gotta go through my list we've talked about context we've talked about good scenes inner thoughts is dialogue so I just wanted to note this. Is Helen always going to have inner thoughts? Um, I'm sorry, Eva. Is Eva always going to have inner thoughts? So, yes, unless um, I'm going to have a few other key characters. So the point of view might change and be them, obviously. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I do plan on carrying inner thoughts throughout okay. the piece. So rather than giving three extra words here to thanks Helen, 
giving her an inner thought here that contradicts what she says out loud is another way to bring about that emotional texture. Um, I like how you're using inner thoughts here, right? We need to make sure that we're using an inner thought as dialogue. So when you have, if you have two people talking and mm -hmm. one of them has inner thoughts, you actually have three people in that conversation, right? You've got the two people talking and then the person's brain. Up here, uh, let me see if I can find it. There is a place here. Originally, you had deep breath Eva on this. You had Eva roll her eyes. I'll get my practice. I'll Sorry, I'll get it if I practice it, maybe. Her hands shook as she lifted the flute. Deep breaths Eva in italics. And you had that all on the same line. Treat this as a new person talking. Okay. Right? So drop it down to the next line. You're putting it in italics so we know it's our inner thought. And then I would take, you then had her go straight into playing. I would take this moment where she's playing and punch it up here to separate out her playing all in one block. Again, it's about thinking about it cinematically, right? We want her to roll her eyes, say her thing. We want to see her hand shake a little bit. Really nice emotional texture detail that lets us know how she's feeling. We see her hand shake a little bit. We want to hear her think deep breath, Eva. We then want to tell us she starts to play and then we can hear the playing in our head. Does that make sense? So it's that like pacing the scene cinematically so that we can watch it unfold in our imaginations and you become kind of the guide driving our imaginations to picture this moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all that to say, make sure you're treating these, these inner thoughts always as their own voice, uh, as their own person in the scene. Um, you'll find you get a lot of interplay that way because now you have like a Jiminy Cricket on your character's shoulder is what inner thoughts end up being, uh, which is really great for, I think it fits really well for these YA a type characters in which they're, um, you know, the inner life is typically in contradiction with the mask that is being shown to the world. So that's a good... Um, the question will be for you when we do inner thoughts is, do the inner thoughts convey who the character is becoming? So because it's a, a, a recent book I read, it's on my mind, you know, TJ Klune did this really great in the house in the Cerulean Sea in that Linus's inner thoughts are actually Linus's exterior vocalizations at the end of the book. He starts speaking his mind which is where the character goes. So the question with Eva is how is she going to change from the beginning to the end of the book? And are you going to use, you don't have to, but are you going to use those inner thoughts as a demonstration for how she's changing? If the inner thoughts aren't what she's becoming, they need to be a conversation about the resistance of her becoming that thing. Does that make sense? Yes. That was a lot of words at one time, I'm sorry. <laughs> So we have a couple ways we can go with inner thoughts. They can be the example of who the person is becoming, right? Like Linus in the House of the Zerulean Z, the inner thought is Linus learns to speak his mind. So we hear his mind from the beginning of the book, but we're the only ones hearing it until finally it starts to come out into the world, right? That's one way to go. Another way to go is that the inner thoughts are eva processing the change she needs to undergo so let's say that eva is shy and she needs to become more outgoing the inner thoughts are going to be a conversation about whether or not she wants to become more outgoing does that make sense yes yeah so bridget jones diary her inner thoughts are a conversation about a conversation with herself about what's happening and about the changes she has to undergo in order to become the character that we love, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I think those are the two examples that come to mind. I was sorry, I was trying to grab a better example, but I can't. I can't pull one off the top of my head. Um, yeah. So thinking about how you're using Eva's inner thoughts strategically to convey character change, I think you have a real opportunity here. Have you already thought about that? Do you know which way you're going with her? No. Okay. Honestly, I did a lot of um, 
you know, trying to plan the characters, do character Bibles, things like that. But um, it finally got to the point where in order to get to know who she was, I was really going to have to write her and see who she was. So I'm still just kind of in that phase a little bit with these early chapters of really seeing who she is and how she's developing and with that inner life and then figuring out from there. Yeah. How that's going to work. And yeah, it's so hard. I think for me, I'm the same way. The like plot conflict comes really easy for me, right? Like if I'm solving a murder, like I write murder, I write mysteries. So it's like, okay, someone was killed and I need to figure out how that person is yeah. like how that murder is solved super easy but like how who my detective becomes through the journey of solving that murder that i i'm the same way i have to write it out i would recommend using these inner, like thinking about these inner thoughts when you're editing and being like okay i'm now that i'm doing my second draft of this and i know who eva is and who she's becoming what how am i using these inner thoughts as a tool to bring the reader into that emotional yeah. change of my character. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's inner thoughts. Oh, flashback scenes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me why you've got a flashback here in the middle of the scene. Um, what yeah. purpose is this serving? So I was trying to build they are kind of mystery things that they are going to be smuggling a manuscript and that is hidden in the wagon seat and when i was researching you know wagons and buckboards and things usually a buckboard is just like one thin seat that's up on springs right and so but this has an extra depth to it which is where they actually hide the manuscript to transport it so without coming out and saying exactly what was happening, I was trying to work a way to describe what was going on and kind of that mystery of why is this thicker and what's, why is this different from a normal wagon and, and what they're doing. Okay. I, I, I love that you're thinking ahead and that you're like, oh, I got to do this thing because the worst thing we can do as an author is suddenly there needs to be a manuscript hidden and you're like, oh, and by the way, this wagon is different than other wagons. It has a secret hiding compartment. <laughs> um, that kind of like on the like on the fly changes to, to imagine yeah. a structure um, that the reader has already built can be frustrating for the reader. So it's good that you're like showing them the reader, hey, this wagon's a little bit different. The problem in the piece here is, and I'm I'm not reading this for you because you know your own piece. I'm reading it for anybody that might listen. Eva's eyes strayed back to the wagon seat. Most wagons in Truthia had a single board set of the spring driver, but Pastor Thomas's wagon seat was much thicker. Don't want anybody falling through now, do we? He would reply with a chuckle when asked about it. So that line there is the flashback. Yes, it holds up quite well. What he didn't say was what it was all holding. So that line right there is the flashback. Putting his dialogue in the middle of Eva's memory is yeah. just messy. It's like, oh, this is no longer clean. And it slows me down as a reader and makes me say like, wait, okay. Did he say that now? When did he say that? When he was asked about it? Okay. It's just that extra beat of reading that makes the reading a little more difficult, especially for YA. We want to keep it as smooth as possible so as much as we can stay in the moment the better so i would just take this and put it at the top right like you need to talk about the wagon anyway right like you need to give us a little bit more description yeah. of the wagon anyway when the horse stumbles and they hit a pothole have her reach out and grab the the like to steady herself and then she can comment on it and then he can say you know what he's going to say third person limited does she know that it's holding something she does so she knows what the mission is which is why it's important for her to play this flute piece um because the the handoff is going to happen while she's doing that piece that's supposed to be emotionally strong for the magistrate and different things so hopefully everyone will be paying attention to her and what she's doing gotcha. while this place so that's why she has the pressure to get this ballot right but she hasn't it's something that they kind of recently figured out to do. And so 
as far as that particular ballad being the strong piece. And so she's got to get it right in time. So that, I didn't know that reading the piece, that texture you just gave me changes the emotional intensity of her needing to practice. Right now, you think she needs to practice because she's obsessive compulsive and a little anal about her playing. So this is one of those tricks you're playing on the reader that may be a little unfair. Okay. Right? Yeah, I didn't know that much of a mystery. So yeah. Yeah. But so That's tell us, thing. tell us at the beginning, and you don't have to tell us they're hiding something illegal. You don't have to tell us that like that they're um, you know, on this secret mission. But hint to us that she understands that she's keeping everyone safe. Right. Yeah. That's the key thing for Eva that I'm trying to pull out is her. She wants to keep her loved ones safe. Yeah. Um, because her father was killed before. Haven't delved in the backstory yet, obviously. But, yeah, and we don't need the yeah, and that's great. We don't need right. the backstory here. Yeah, like but, but what, keeping keeping people safe is is her main motivation. Yeah. So somewhere up here at the beginning, you know, you need to so there's a couple things you gotta introduce in the chapter. There's the wagon being different than a normal wagon there's the context of eva's obsessive practicing coming from her fear of what's going on and that pastor thomas knows all that so there's you know up here somewhere when you're explaining the wagon that's where i would put the like this is different she puts her hand on it and she knows what it's hiding don't tell us what it's hiding just that it's hiding something and then down here where he's telling her it's going to be fine you know have something about like if it's not perfect what happens right like if everybody's not focused on me that means they might see you and then let him respond to that right like let him have some kind of response of like you know we have to have faith or like this is something that like you know uh, okay uh, prayer and fasting right like something that like comes like, brings us his response to trouble right like and what you're doing there is you're seeding for us like okay this isn't a story about musicians going to play and it's not a story about eva the anxious flute player this is a story about people who are going to do something brave and right now i'm only going to show you the flute yeah right like but it's that kind of like giving the reader the emotional context so that they know where they're going in the same way that you got to give them the scenery of the box we need to know what the air feels like in the box right like so yeah i would totally put that up front um okay. yeah and no no uh flashbacks oh um, <laughs> in lit fiction flashbacks are fantastic because they make everything complicated and lit fiction readers are showing up for the complication so they're like where am i in this moment and what does this flashback mean for the depth of this character and but for ya we just want to move right like so we just want to keep keep going uh don't pull us out of the moment to take us backwards unless you're gonna have a whole scene that's a flashback and then you can do flashbacks all day um yeah all right, well, that was all I had. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Um, I don't think so. I think that gave me a lot of good things to work with and things to think about and work on and and work into and carry through. So I really appreciate you taking the time to look at that and delve into that and teach me a lot of things today. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm I'm pumped for you. It's a great it's a great opening chapter, and I'm excited to see what you do with it. Um, all right, I'm going to stop the recording, and we can talk a little bit more.